Uh, next speaker is Dr. U. A. W. L. Pereira, Senior Registrar in General Medicine from National Hospital Kendi. Uh, uh, she is MBBS from Yavarpur University, uh, PG Diploma in Elderly Medicine and MD in Medicine. Uh, and her topic is hyponatremia, a uh, practical approach. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for in inviting me for this uh, Young Physicians Forum. Today I'm going to talk about hyponatremia. So I thought of doing this lecture It is because it is one important electrolyte abnormality we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. According to literature, what they say is hyponatremia occurs in 15% of our hospitalized patients. By definition, what hyponatremia means, your so serum sodium value is less than 135 millimoles per liter. They can present to us with various ways. If they are having severe hyponatremia, uh, clinical de presentation can depend on severity of hyponatremia as well as the rapidity of onset. According to uh, severity, we can classify hyponatremia into three groups. When they are having mild hyponatremia, the serum sodium values are between 130 to 134. If they are having moderate kind of hyponatremia, the levels are between 125 to 129. If they are having severe symptomatic hyponatremia, the serum sodium values are less than 125. They can present to us in various ways. If they are having mild sort of hyponatremia, the symptoms could be very subtle. They can present to us with even nausea, muscle cramps, malaise, and even with non-specific kind of headaches. If they are having severe hyponatremia, they can present to us with confusional states, altered behavior, even seizures. Also, they can end up with a coma. So, I would like to begin my presentation with a case scenario. So, this 30-year-old female presented to us with a non-specific kind of a headache and nausea. She is a diagnosed patient with schizophrenia. She was on haloperidol, which was defaulted for two months. On examination, she was a febrile with a heart rate of 80 and with a blood pressure of 130 by 90. Her urine output was significant. It was 120 mils per hour. So if we look at her labs, her serum sodium value was 116, her urine sodium value was 35, and her urine specific gravity was 1.003, and the serum osmolality was 214. All the other investigations were normal. So the question for the clinician is, what is causing this hyponatremia? Is it due to nephrogenic DI? Is it due to excessive water intake, what you call psychogenic polydipsia? Is it due to SIAG? which has resulted from psychiatric treatment? Is it due to surreptitious intake of diuretics? Is it due to this state called reset osmostat? For that, you have to answer three simple questions. First question is, is it real hyponatremia? Second question is, is the water, is the water handling uh, appropriate in the body? Third question is, is the ADS secretion appropriate? So. The answer to my first question, is it real hyponatremia? For that, you have to know what is plasma osmolality. For that, we have this equation. That is 2 into sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus blood dura nitrogen divided by 2.8. According to patients' plasma osmolality, we can divide them into three groups. First group being hyposmolar state, when their osmolality is more than 285. Especially in our patients with diabetic ketoacidosis, when they have high glucose levels, you got, get this hyposmolar hyponatremia. And in patients with renal failure, when they have high urea, it, they have this state called hyposmolar hyponatremia. The second group is when your patient is having isosmolar state. Especially in patients with paraproteinemia, when they have high protein levels, you get this state. And other patients with very high lipid levels, you get this hypoosmolar hyponatremia. But mind you that they have to have very high lipid levels to drop the sodium levels by one or two. The third group is hypoosmolar hyponatremia. That is when your osmolality is less than 285. So that's what you call true hyponatremia. So this table shows you how to differentiate true hyponatremia from pseudo hyponatremia. So when you measure their sodium, in two instances, the sodium values are low. 
But if you do a direct assay, uh, say, like if you do a ABG, the sodium will be low in uh, true hyponatremia, but it will be normal in pseudo hyponatremia. If you take their serum osmolality, it will be low in true hyponatremia patients, but it will be either normal or high in pseudo hyponatremic patients. Your true hyponatremic patients are almost always symptomatic, but the pseudo hyponatremic patients are asymptomatic. We have already discussed the causes for pseudo hyponatremia. So, answer to my second question is the water handling appropriate? For that, you have to look at the urine osmolality. In the normal body, kidney recognizes this hyponatremia as a state of excess water. So it will try to remove the water from your body that will result in dilution of your urine, resulting in reduction in urine osmolality. From the labs, you don't get this urine osmolality directly. For that, you have to do a small calculation. What you get is urine specific gravity. For instance, for example, if you take it's 1.004, you have to take the last two digits of the serum urine, osmo, urine specific gravity and multiply it by 35 to get the value of urine osmolality. So, when your urine osmolality is high, it should be more than 200. You say it's low when it's below 150. So, mind you, if your water handling is appropriate, you have to expect a low urine osmolality. So, when you're having a patient with low osmolality, urine osmolality, there are two possibilities. It could be either psychogenic polydysphere or you have to think of this uh, phenomenon called reset osmostat. I, I'm going to talk more on this reset osmostat, which is commoner than we think. We encounter this in our day-to-day -day practice. What happens is the patient with reset osmostat, they behave similar to those patients with normal ADH, except their threshold for ADH secretion is a bit lower. This causes to increase water conservation by their kidneys, leading to lowering of their serum osmolality, resulting in hyponatremia. So, if you try and correct their sodium, what will happen is that will result in increase in their plasma osmolality, which will trigger vasopressin secretion. So, in cases of reset osmostat, never try and correct sodium. You have to always find the cause which is, which is triggering reset osmostat. So, there are cause, few causes associated with this reset osmostat. One is pregnancy. What they say is due to the vasodilatation they are having, there's an ADS secretion in pregnant patients and also they tend to have these vasodilatory hormones like relaxin. Uh, the medical conditions associated with this reset osmostat are tuberculosis, which is very common in our epidemiological practice, and uh, malnutrition, and alcohol, and epilepsy. And we this things the, the, we see this commonly in our quadriplegic patients and there are some common malignancies giving rise to reset osmostat like gastric, colonic and odd cell malignancies. So when you find a patient you have to always look out for these causes. So there are a few points I would like to highlight here. If your patient is having a reset osmostat the sodium levels they are having a mild to moderate hyponatremia and they are always asymptomatic. There's a test to differentiate this reset osmostat from SIADH. You call it water load test. What you do there is you give a water load at least 10 ml per kg orally or you can give IV 5% dextrose. And you, in normal individuals as well as these reset osmostat patients, they excrete more than 80% of what you give within 4 hours duration. But of course, this test is not validated. In SIADH, the excess vasopressin levels would not be suppressed despite the reduction in serum osmolality that will lead to fluid retention, further resulting in reduction of their serum osmolality and serum sodium. So there's another small test you can use to diagnose this reset osmostat. You call it fractional excretion of urea. According to literature, it's a good indicator of reset osmostat when it's normal, regardless of patient's sodium and serum urate levels. So, answer to my third question, is the ADA secretion appropriate in the patient? So, for that, you have to look at patient's volume status. Uh, whether you have to see whether your patient is hypervolemic or hypovolemic. Actually, hypervolemia you can detect very easily. But sometimes you can miss uh, subtle signs of hypovolemia. 
there are indicators to detect volume status in patients like capillary page pressures, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, central venous pressure that sometimes can underrepresent the volume status of the patient. In instance like this, you can use this urine sodium as a good indicator of the volume, hypovolemia. According to literature, they say it's 80% sensitive and 100% specific. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. You can't use urine sodium to assess volume status in patients with renal failure when your patient is on diuretics. Other one is when your patient is having cerebral salt pasting and your patient is having metabolic alkalosis. When you have excess bicarbonate, your body will try to remove sodium with as sodium bicarbonate. In those instances, you can what you can use is urea creatinine ratios. So, the first thing you see is whether your patient is hypovolemic. Then, if you get a patient with euvolemia, you have to consider this state called SIADH. Uh, before diagnosing SIADH, you have to always exclude hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency in these patients. If your patient is hypervolemic, that could be secondary to heart failure, cirrhosis, or even renal failure. So, going back to our case, uh, how was the serum osmolality? It was 240. 240 is low osmolality, indicating that she is having true hyponatremia. How was the patient's water handling? Her urine osmolality, if we calculate her urine specific gravity, as you can remember, it was 1.003. So you have to take the last two digits and multiply it by 35. It's 105. So you have a low urine osmolality. When you are having a low urine osmolality here in our patient, you are left with two possibilities. One is whether it's reset osmostat, whether it's psychogenic polydipsia. But you didn't see any causes giving rise to this reset osmostat in our case scenario. So you are left with the second diagnosis, it's psychogenic polydipsia. That's the easy way, way to tackle a case with hyponatremia. So going back to physiology, two major hormones are involved in sodium regulation. One is the vasopressin. It is secreted from posterior pituitary. It is working at the collecting tubules of the nephron, resulting in water reabsorption. These vasopressin levels are very difficult to measure in our clinical practice. What we do is we get the urine osmolality, which is an accurate thing representing the activity of vasopressin. Second thing is these commercial assays we have are not sensitive for low concentrations of ADH. And they have found out a novel marker called copeptin, which is, can be used as a surrogate marker of this vasopressin. And the second hormone involved in the sodium regulation is aldosterone. It's a hormone secreted by the sonar glomerulosa acting on the adrenal cortex and works at distal convoluted tubule of the nephron to reabsorb water and sodium in exchange of potassium and hydrogen. So, how to evaluate a patient with hyponatremia? First thing, you have to assess their volume status. Check whether they are hypovolemic, euvolemic or hypervolemic. And the second point is you have to see whether they have, de they have developed this uh, hyponatremia acutely. Acutely means within 48 hours. You have to take a good history and you have to see their past records about the documented sodium values. And if they have developed it acutely, they are at greater risk of developing complications. There you have to intervene very aggressively. If the, they have developed hyponatremia chronically, the onset should be more than 48 hours. Then they are at risk of developing complications if you overcorrect their sodium. The fourth point you have to remember is you have to always exclude pseudo hyponatremia. Then fourth point is before trying to correct sodium, you have to pre preserve their serum and urine for analysis. That point we might forget when we are practicing our words. First, you have to go through their drug charts. There are so many drugs which can give rise to hyponatremia. Sometimes the patients are on unnecessary proton pump inhibitors. So you have to look at the drug chart and find out whether they are on these drugs like di famous diuretics like thiazide, antipsychotic medication and even antihypertensives like commonly used ones, AC inhibitors, amlodipine and even antiepileptics like carbamazine, pin, valproate can give rise to hyponatremia. So you have to always try and withhold these medications. Of course, with these antiepileptics and antihypertensives, you can stop, can't stop them then, then and there. You have to get expert help and change over, change over the drug to something else which is not giving rise to hyponatremia. Those are the simple measures you can do. 
So a word on SIADH. What happens is in SIADH is there's increased secretion of vasopressin, maybe from the pituitary, maybe from the ectopics, ectopic uh, site. There are diagnostic criteria available. The patient's serum osmolality should be less than 275. And the urine osmolality should be more than 100. And the patient should be euvolemic. And if you measure urine sodium, it's more than 30. And you have to exclude adrenal, thyroid, pituitary and renal insufficiency before diagnosing this SIDH. And they should not be on any diuretics. There are supplementary criteria, so you can uh, take one or, if one or two, like fractional excretion of ex, uh, urea or fractional uric acid excretion to help in diagnosing this SIADH in difficult situations. So when you diagnose SIADH, you have to then and there look for the cause which is giving rise to this SIADH. There are so many causes. I have listed few important ones here. There are neoplastic conditions like lung malignancies, GI malignancies, thymomas, lymphomas, even leukemias can result in SIADH. There are pulmonary infections like TB, aspergillosis, which can give rise to SIADH. If you take the central nervous system, even the infections when you have central nervous system bleeds, head trauma, and even GBS can give rise to SIADH. There are a list, list of drugs which are giving rise to SIDH. I'm not going to highlight here. And of course, there are idiopathic and hereditary causes giving rise to SIDH. So if you take the management, what you have to do is fluid restriction. You have to restrict all the intake consumed by the patient. Aim, if, aim of restriction is you have to cut down at least 500 milliliters less than the last 24 hours urine output. Of course, this res fluid restriction regimes might not succeed always. So there are predictors of failure. So I have highlighted few here. If your patients are having high urine osmolality, more than 500, or their sum of urine sodium and potassium concentrations are exceeding serum sodium concentration, or if their last 24 urine output is less than 1,005, or when you try to correct sodium with this fluid registration regime for 24 to 48 hours, still the increase is less than 2 millimoles per liter. So you have to think your fluid restriction regime is failing. There, you have to consider adding on other therapeutic options like urea. In other countries, they use urea. And here, we, what is available is Vaptans. So we can use this Vaptans. If your SIDH patient is severely symptomatic, you can think of using hypertonic saline. So a little bit on Vaptans. The action is to block ADH action to pure water diuresis, no direct effect on sodium or potassium. You have oral Vaptans and IV Vaptans. Of course, they have major limitations. First thing is the extreme cost. A tablet costs around 500 rupees. And overly rapid, the tendency to get an overly rapid correction. And FDA, they have advised limited duration of use for these Vaptans. The cutoff of Vaptan is 30 days. Cutoff for Conivaptan is 4 days. They are associated with side defects like liver derangements. And they are contraindicated to be used with drugs causing this enzyme inhibition, CYP3-4A inhibition. Drugs like clarithromycin can't be used together. So you should not use these Vaptans on patients who are hypovolemic. Little word on cerebral salt wasting. It is characterized by hypovolemia, polyuria, urine osmolality more than 100, and urine sodium should be more than 40. They are secondary to intracranial pathology. They are, the point you have to remember is you should not restrict fluid here. You have to replace fluids, give salts, and think of giving fludrocortisone. And there are ways and means to differentiate SIDH. Your SIDH patients are having low intravascular volume. Their urine sodium is very much high. They are polyuric. And if you take fractional excretion of urate after correction, it's high in cerebral salt wasting. How to treat C acute severe hyponatremia is you have to consider giving 3% saline. You can give us a bolus 100 to 150 minutes over 20 minutes. And you have to repeat the serum electrolytes and see whether you are achieving the correct amount. And you can even give continuous infusions of 3% saline until you recover the symptoms or at least you reach a 10% cutoff. How to calculate the rate is you get the infusion rate and uh, multiply it by the patient's weight. And then you get the duration. You have to give this 3% saline. At least for hourly, you have to check their uh, sodium values. About the trial evidence, in this SALSA trial, they have evaluated two uh, giving bolus regime and the continuation regime, they say that both are equally effective. There's no difference in two. Managing chronic hyponatremia is somewhat different. You have to aim for a lower goal, like 4 to 6 millimoles per rise in 24 hours. Maximum correction is 10 per 24 hours. 
So you can think of restricting fluid and you can give things like low, low diuretics, urea, which is acting via osmotic diuresis, and you can consider giving baptans. Before ending the presentation, I would like to talk about this osmotic demyelination syndrome, which is a drastic complication of overcorrecting sodium in our patients. It's a state, irreversible state. There are factors associated with osmotic demyelination syndrome, like chronic alcoholism, malnutrition, liver transplantation, renal patients who are undergoing dialysis, pregnant patients with hyperemesis gravidarum, those who are having low hypokalemic uh, those who are having hypokalemia are prone to get this osmotic demyelination. Depends on the area involved in the central nervous system, whether it's involved in the pons or whether it's involved in the extrapontine regions. They can present to us with classic presentation of dysarthria dysphagia or they can present with tremors ataxia, which can also result in locked in syndrome. These are the classic MRI signs you see in osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is called trident sign. So you can appreciate the trident sign in this MRI picture. You get this for your picture test, so you might have to know these things. This is the other classic sign you get in osmotic demyelination. It will take at least one week to develop these signs, but you can appreciate this figlet sign here in this MRI picture. So um, before winding up, a little bit on treatment. There is no proven treatment for established osmotic demyelination syndrome. Uh, and uh, if we, what we do is re-lowering the sodium using 5% dextrose or desmopressin. It has limited benefit according to the literature. Other the treatment modalities they talk about are, they talk about thyrotrophin releasing hormone, corticosteroids, immunoglobulins, and they have tried this plasmapheresis on some patients with a limited benefit. So my take-home messages are always when you treat, before treating your patient, preserve their sodium uh, serum and urine for analysis uh, uh, right away and look at their drug chart and try and omit the, all the unnecessary drugs which are giving rise to hyponatremia. If you are diagnosed with, if the patient is diagnosed with SIDH, try to find the cause and when you are managing hyponatremia, it's always according to the severity as well as the rapidity of onset and try and always prevent this drastic complication called osmotic demyelination syndrome. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pereira. And uh, we are open for questions. It is well known that uh, thiazide diuretics cause, are prone to cause uh, hyponatremia more than loop diuretics. Yeah. What is the reason for that? Thiazide diuretics like, you know, moderatic, it's very common, but not for loop diuretics. What is the reason for that? Do you know the reason? I'm just asking, I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, I'll ask another question then. Yeah. Now, in cases where there is uh, no, uh, sometimes the present saline is uh, not available in some other hospitals, right? yeah. especially at present, do you advocate using normal saline which has 154 millimoles of sodium. Do you advocate using that? In patients? Hyponatremia, yeah. SIDH. You know, no, no 3% saline available and it's fairly severely hyponatremic. Normal saline has 154 millimoles yeah. per liter. You so can't uh, use normal saline on SIDH, sir. You will like retain more fluid and it will result in more lowering of the sodium. So yeah. better not to use them rather than using it on them. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. What, uh, the thing you said was reset. Uh, Osmostat. Yes. Osmostat. Uh, what's their uh, volume status? Are they dehydrated or euvolemic? Uh, they are actually, sir, uh, hypovolemic. So it's like a dehydration. Yeah. Like, uh, it's like a setting of dehydration. Yeah. You lose more water. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, if you see patients who are on hypo, uh, with hyponatremia, yes. we see a prescri prescription of uh, oral salt. Yeah, that's wrong, sir. Yeah, if you see, if you see 90, no, like 100 patients, you see 80 to 90 yeah. uh, p patients are on oral salt. Yeah. What's your recommendation on that? And if you are using it, what is the predicted uh, rise in sodium if you are using oral salt? So, yeah, oral salt, sir, there's no place in SIDH. 
as well as in hypervolemic patients. I have seen it commonly used in cardiology patients because they are always having hyponatremia. Uh, there is a place in cerebral salt wasting. You can use it, sir. Predicted rise, it's, uh, when the patient is having chronic hyponatremia, you can use it, but the target should be less than 10 per day. But you have to slowly correct it, sir. Like one, one, what they add is one teaspoon TDS, that's what we add, used to add. But in cerebral salt wasting, there's a place. Like uh, and uh, in chronic hyponatremia, you can add it, but very slowly, at least less than 10 target you should maintain, sir. Combination of diuretics plus oral salt in uh, SIDH? Uh, no. No, sir. To my knowledge, no. Thank you. And uh, there are these older people who walk around without any changes in their behavior with a sodium of 120, 728. Uh, do you need to treat them? Is it common in old age? Is yes, common, sir. Actually, elderly, that's another factor giving rise to reset osmostat. So they are commonly asymptomatic. So you can evaluate them. If you can't find another cause, you have to always exclude SIDH. And if there's no cause, that's okay to remain in the low sodium values. But it should be not like they should not have very low sodium values. Moderate to mild, that's okay. Moderate to mild levels actually can be due to reset osmostat. That I have seen several cases in my practice also. Sir. So you give the the, the normal saline or no oral, uh, sort of you give water and see whether you excrete 80% yeah, of water low test you can so do to differentiate by, from SIDH. And if it suggests you have reset osmostat, you can leave them like that. You don't have to treat. But always find whether they're having any underlying cause. That's the importance. So don't correct their sodium. That will lead to drastic complications in the recent osmostat. But that's what they say, at least. In the neurosurgical wards, we get referrals yes, for sir. low sodium. And uh, it is very difficult sometimes to see whether these uh, cerebral salt wasting or SIDH. Yes. How do you quickly differentiate between the two? The volumes uh, I discussed is a... Uh, Actually, uh, you can, uh, they, they are polyuric. Cerebral salt wasting patients are polyuric. Uh, SIDH patients, urine output is low. And uh, the other one I have highlighted here, sir, uh, uh, they are having uh, urine sodium very much higher than SIADH people, cerebral salt wasting patients. And if you correct sodium, sir, in SIADH, the fractional excretion of urea. Uh, urate will be normal after correction, but in uh, cerebral salt wasting, it will be still high, sir. So those are the three easy ways to differentiate. After correction also, fractional excretion of urate is high in cerebral salt wasting, and urine output, you can go by the urine sodium and the volume status of the patient. Those are the four simple ways you can differentiate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pereira. I can still remember Dr. S. D. asking me the same question in my viva. <laughs> and uh, the Ceylon College of Physicians is very thankful for this uh, uh, excellent lecture by, given by Dr. Uh, Dr. Perera, and good luck. Thank you.